You're listening to episode number 262 of the Amplify Your Awesome podcast. I'm your host, Yang Pratt, and I am so glad you are tuning in today. This episode is day number three of the Kickstart Your Book five-day challenge. If there is a book in you and you're ready to release it into the world, this challenge is for you. And if you know someone else who has a book in them and is ready to unleash that, we'd love for you to share the website kickstartyourbook.com. Even though it is day number three of the challenge, we invite you to come on in and start today because today is the best day to begin an amazing adventure and we'd love to see you inside the challenge. This episode, again, is the audio version of day number three of the challenge. If you have missed anything, just go to kickstartyourbook.com so you can get access to all of the emails and all of the resources we've created for you to help you be successful this week as you kickstart your book. And now, here is episode number 261 of the Amplify Your Awesome podcast. It's day number three here at Kickstart Your Book, and Callie and I are so excited. You've reached that halfway point already, so give yourselves a hand, claps all around. That's a big deal. I know people, I have done this and I've been guilty. I've gone into challenges with all the best intentions, and then something happened and I didn't actually do it. So for those of you who are here every day doing the work, I mean, you're, you're building this momentum to get your book out into the world this year. So first of all, let's just celebrate that. And how are you today, Callie? Oh, I'm great. How are you? I am so good. Today is a fun day. We were just talking about all of the posts in the group and we're loving the interaction. We're loving the questions. We're loving how you're diving in and answering the questions. And today, for some of you, this is a stretch. It's We're asking you to tackle a new piece of technology and do something you may never have done. And this is why we are here. I know. It's exciting. And I haven't listened to the audio yet, but I am totally planning on doing it as soon as we get off the video today. Awesome. Gabrielle said she thinks she earned a promotion because she was able to, <laughs> to figure out water. <laughs> I, I, that sure. I um I will and I love that um Gabriel is is sticking to it because we've had talks about that. So it's <laughs> going good. <laughs> yeah, so today the mission is should you choose to accept it, is to capture and create. And we're asking you to use a tool that Kelly and I both love and use called Otter, O-T-T-E-R dot A-I. And we are not affiliates. We both just use the software. We love it. It's portable. You can use it on your computer as well. So there's lots of cool applications. Let me take a look in the group too and see who is here. I know that Marsha says hello. And we're, when, you're, when you're joining, if you would just remember to type your names in there because we can only see Facebook users. I'm going to yeah. go over to my it's Mary phone. and Marsha. Okay, perfect. Hi, Mary. Hi, Marcia. All right. Good morning, ladies. It's an exciting day. Yes. So yesterday I had told everyone I was going to share a little story that related to today because today is all about the voice. And before I share the story, Kelly, can you talk about the impact of our voices coming through, even in our nonfiction works? Well, so I hit on this a little bit in the video that I posted earlier about word count. And so if you if you had a question, Nancy had the question about word count. And so I wanted to address that because I figured other people were having that same same thought process. It was a great question. But with with voice. And um, so in nonfiction, it's really easy to fall into one of the biggest, what I consider one of the biggest writing pitfalls, and that is information dumps. And mm -hmm. that is where you just take the fact and you just like almost word vomit, like facts at us. So, and it, usually this shows up, you can kind of identify it. A lot of times it will be like a block of information altogether, like six or seven sentences, and they're all just fact like 
Yes. Just straightforward fact. And the problem is, is that when you have the, um, you have these information dumps, they sound like a robot listing off the facts. So I, you know, I like iced tea. I make iced tea with ice mint, you know, like, I mean, I, I don't have a really great example of it, but it's, it's almost like there's no voice behind it. It's just you reading like a research paper. And we know um, those of you that are in the kidlet world and you dealt with nonfiction in the kidlet world, we know that it's bad to make it sound like a book report. You never want your story to sound like a book report in any form that it is. And so it's really important that your voice comes through on that so that you, um, you're not just word vomiting information onto us. Mm -hmm. We actually feel like we're having a conversation with someone. And um, it's great if it's a nonfiction subject that you have experience with. It's really great sometimes to pull in your your real life experience. Um, a perfect example of that is right now I'm editing in a, a book about EFT and it's used for children. And so the mm -hmm. lady that wrote the book has a three-year-old son that she does EFT with. And so she gives her experiences with her son throughout the book um, and it makes it sound very conversational. In fact, there's a lot of parts in the book where you feel like you're, you're just getting a letter from her where she's telling you these things. And so that's what you want to strive. And that's one of the reasons that we're focusing on maybe using a tool like Otter because it will sound just the way you talk. Yeah. And I think there's a misperception that, you know, when you write a book, it has to be written a certain way and it, it shouldn't sound like you talk. But in this day and age, that is exactly false. The opposite is true. The more your book can sound a conversation and it can sound the way you speak, the more it's going to resonate with people. And I struggle with this too. And in my first book, Kelly, you hit on all the subjects that I really struggle with. You know, I my book was based on a lot of research that I had done throughout graduate school and after that, and some some experiments that I was doing in my performing arts school using this particular teaching methodology. And my my editor kept coming back and saying, it doesn't sound like you, like what happened to you? Like, I'm not getting any of you. It sounds like a book report. It sounds like a research paper. And this is not a research, I mean, it's, research backed book, but it's not like all like a research paper that you would submit for, you know, publication into some research journal. So she just kept challenging me to do that. And I had a really hard time understanding this idea of voice. And because when I when I would read it to myself, and I didn't have a tool like Otter, I didn't read it out loud, other than just to myself, but I couldn't hear back that there was a disconnect when I started telling my story and then going into the research and coming back, there was a total disconnect. And I got called on that so many times and <laughs> Otter is so great because when you listen back and I know the first time you listen to yourself back, it's, it's makes you want to cringe. I have been there. I have experienced that. So I know what that feels like. Just get past that and just listen for the story, the continuity. Does your voice stay consistent? Are you talking about all the research, you know, in one paragraph and then in one, you know, something different? We want to be able to balance out how the book goes through. And that leads us to the idea of pacing, which in the email this morning, we told you we dive a little bit more into pacing because while we're in the beginning of stages of this book, it's it's good to think about this idea of pacing and balancing out your book. So Kelly, can you talk a little bit more about what pacing is and the idea of balance, even in the beginning stages of writing and creating. Yeah. So um, pacing is, is the flow of the book is the, is the best way I just, I can describe it. So when you, when you are talking um, in, and this is true of anything. So we, whether you're a fiction writer or nonfiction, pacing affects everything. So does information dumps, but pacing is also a big issue. And so if the pacing of the book is off. It can also affect the writing. So the way that you can check this is you can read the book to somebody else. You can read it on something like Otter and have it read, you know, sounded back to you. Um, 
a, a good way with bigger manuscripts that you can't just read out loud in one setting is just to read through it and see if there's any places that you get hung up, like that you mm -hmm. you're reading and then you and you have to reread parts. Lots of times that is our brain like signaling to us that there is a pacing issue. Um, so mm -hmm. so pacing um, can lots of times if you have like really long sentences um and there is there is another tool that we have not discussed and um, in fact i'm not even sure i've told you about it young that's called mm -hmm. readability.io it's a free website that you can go and you can actually mm -hmm. plug in what you um what you are writing and it will tell you it will like signify things that make the real readability rating of it go up so it will signify if you have a word that's over i think 10 letters it will mm -hmm. highlight that if you have a sentence that's longer than 15 words it will highlight that if you have a lot of compound sentences, if you use passive voice instead of active voice, um, because the the pitfall of passive voice is that it doesn't move the action forward. It kind of actually makes the action almost go backwards. Um, so it's always important to write with an active voice. So it will highlight some of those areas for mm -hmm. you. Um, it's also a, for your for your story, it's good to do this for like a section just to get an idea of like, are you really speaking on your audience's level? And right. um, the only thing that I would actually add to anything about readability is um, always remember that the general audience is, is at like a sixth grade level. Um, so if your readability rating is coming in really high, like say 12th grade level, which can be very common for nonfiction, um, ask yourself if your audience would actually be at that level. Would they be educated? Mm -hmm. Would they be, are you talking to the general person on the street? Are you talking to a specific audience that would have an upper level education? Um, so keep those things in mind because um, the general population does not have much higher than a sixth grade reading level. So, um, and that can speak to pacing too. If you're speaking mm -hmm. over the readability rating of your audience, um, they're, they're not going to be able to follow the flow of your book. And I did put it in the comments, Callie, it's readability.io, is that correct? Yes, yes, and it's free. There is a paid version that allows you to put in like longer sections and it gives you more detail. Um, I think that if you pay for it, it's like $4 a month. Um, so okay. it's, it's not a super huge investment, but um, I love it. Awesome, awesome. Mary says, I'm getting more from you, sweet ladies, than <laughs> I paid for. Thanks for being here. Oh, that's awesome. We love to hear that. Kelly and I were beyond excited to a class and reconnect after, you know, almost a year and really bring this to you because we love this. We, we, oh, love, yeah. helping you. we love seeing your ideas come to, to fruition because that drives us to get up in the mornings and say, you know, how else can we show up today? So Mary, thank you for those sweet Yes, words. thank you. So Mary also asked, because I'm writing, uh, working on historical fiction, I use the first chapter to introduce characters and setting. The actual events come later. Is that okay? Yeah, that's absolutely okay. Because yeah. um, so in longer, in longer stories, um, like middle grade and up, um, you want to set the scene. So you have to give your reader like a base so that they kind of know where they're at. Um, so that first chapter is really important because not only are you going to introduce like the backstory, like, um, so, so when, when a story happens, there's always something that has happened before the story actually, before we're recording the story, yeah. right? Like there, you know, there's, everybody has a story before before that right mm -hmm. um so the first chapter is always where you're kind of presenting like you're giving the reader kind of an insight into that backstory now you don't have to like like word vomit that out and have it become an information dump because that's that can happen um you kind of want to give it like 
like almost like in bite-sized pieces throughout um, your first, second, third chapter, because those are really the introductory chapters where you're laying out the scene, you're letting us know, and, and even in nonfiction, you have to kind of give us like a place to start from. You're yeah. setting the ground. And in nonfiction, I would say that um, it's really important, like when you're talking about a subject, to really lay the groundwork of why this subject is important to you. Like, why are you interested in it? Why did you take the time to research it? Why are you an expert in this area? Um, and it's, I met with Lucy this morning and that was one of the, the conversations that we had was like, um, for, for entrepreneurs that aren't used to writing, but want to write a book and they're repurposing their content to write mm -hmm. a book, that book then serves as a business card for them to put out into the world. Absolutely. And it, it also is, um, you know, it's, it's a way for them to put all of their knowledge and it makes them an expert because they have now published a book on that that topic and so that's what's really great um, and I love that you speak to this young about just taking what you already have and repurposing it to create something yeah and I think the notion to always want to create as creatives you know we're always having that desire to want to do more and more and more but at some point you know when is enough enough and so the idea of repurposing can really serve all of you because you probably have you know a whole vault of things and when I discovered the idea of repurposing, my life literally changed because I thought, oh my gosh, you know, I may have created something two years ago and it may not sound exactly like me, so I may have to tweak it a bit, but it's still relevant to what I want to share today. It's still relevant to what I'm talking about. So definitely, I encourage you, even if you are starting from, from scratch and brand new ideas with it, this one, you know, just kind of keep a running list, you know, either in Trello or Google Documents or in Otter of just the ideas you have or something you remember writing about. Like, oh, I, I started a story because how many of us have done that, right? You started a story, you started a book and you're super excited. And it's like, eh, the momentum kind of goes like this, right? It goes downhill fast because there's, there's not, you've not prepared yourself to actually go for the long haul. So that's why this challenge is here because when you can start building that momentum and you see the results and you're getting successes and you start building a habit for yourself daily. And that's why so many of you I've, I've questioned, did you put it on your calendar? Like, did you set right. yourself up for success? Because I know that if it's not on my calendar, I'm number one, going to forget about it because I just don't even think, I mean, my, my calendar drives me every day. So definitely make sure that is happening. Right. And the, um, so Mary put in the comments, she said, do I consider why novels because some of her subject matter is too mature for middle grade. So I'm wondering if you're, if you're asking if I consider them for the publishing company, like do I publish YA novels or do I consider them? Um, so I, I do publish YA novels. We've published probably 10 YA novels. I'm kind of losing count at this point. I need, I need to get a better handle on that. Somebody asked me the other day how many books I published, and I was like, well, I don't know. I, I think I've used around 150 IB, ISBN numbers. So I'm using that as a, I've published around 150 books. That's horrible. I should know better. Um, but I just don't. So, I, yes, I publish YA novels. I am. Um, and it's so funny that you asked this question because I will speak a little bit to why a, um, so why a is, is weird. It's a, to me, it's a little bit of weird on the aging of what is appropriate as a YA novel, nonfiction or fiction, because middle grade is pretty defined that it's for eight up to 12. Um, and that sometimes 13, 14, depending on the, the readability level of the reader, but YA can go from 14 to 60 um, mm -hmm. because it's just kind of like we, let's just say we say it's young adult, but I know 40 or 50 year olds that read young adults, you know, and um, so it's kind of one of those things. If you're talking like in nonfiction terms, like in historical fiction, um, I would also think then you, you might keep in like in mind that you're probably talking to an age group of like 14 up to 19, mm -hmm. you know? Um, but I, like I said, I know 60 year olds 
and 40 year olds that read YA. So it's kind of an, it's kind of a deceiving title to put on some books. Yeah, I agree. Because my, my girls, you know, they read those kind of books too, but I know they are considered YA and I'll enjoy them too. And I think oh, yeah. I remember seeing even like Harry Potter is considered a YA series. Yes. Um, which is interesting to me because I don't know that if that was necessarily the the audience she was trying to serve, but I mean it's it's global at this point and it, it, all the age ranges are across the board. But it's interesting, like you said, how they classify it because when I read some of these, I think, wait, why is it considered this and not something different? Right. Um, yeah, so it, it is an interesting sort of title or non-title, I guess. It's kind of anything past middle grade is YA. Or it can be right. right. And I think we, we have a tendency as a culture to shove them all in that, yeah. that thing because there's really not a designation for stuff over that. Like we say, adult book, yeah. you know, like at it, it's, it's really hard. I feel sometimes to classify stuff like that. And so, and it's the same with word count. You know, I think sometimes it's really hard to set word count because you need a certain word count to say something, but then are you using too many words to say something? So it's, that's a really good point. Yes. Yeah. Um, it would be a pitfall either way. Oh, Mary said that YA is one of the most purchased by libraries. That's really oh, I would, yeah. It has the biggest, the biggest body. Yes. Up, right? So anybody that comes in, yeah, that's interesting. Would, and Kelly, can you, can you touch on word count a little bit in nonfiction? I know not everyone sure. has watched the video yet. Can you just give us an overview of that? So, um, so word count with nonfiction can be a really funny thing. So I'll just start with picture books because I know some of you specifically write picture books. So with picture book, nonfiction picture books tend to be longer than fiction picture books. So with fiction, we like to keep the word count under 500. With nonfiction, lots of times they go up to, you know, six or 700. And then there's back matter that can actually take it over a thousand um, with word count. Um, but that is the exception of with the rule, I really feel like, because once you get above that, nonfiction tends to be much shorter than yeah. um, than their their fiction counterparts. So with fiction um, so with fiction with middle grade, a normal middle grade um, fiction book would be anywhere from 30 to um up to 50 or 60,000 words, but their fiction, their nonfiction counterpart may only have, um, uh, what did I say earlier? So if it's, um, like a 200 page book would probably be around, um, 15,000 words, maybe even less than that, 10,000 words. Um, so you're not, you're not getting to the same level because lots of times um, with adult nonfiction, especially unless it's like a major, major topic, like sometimes political books, you'll see that will be four or 500 words. Most of them tend to be under 200 words. Um, and so with word count, I would just say like for the nonfiction round, just focus on getting what you need to get together See what your final word count is. If it is extremely high, think about where you can cut it. Um, I would not worry about it being extremely low unless it, it comes out into under 150 pages. And then I'm, I would recommend adding more meat to it. Right. And I want to give you my take on that, too, because when I because I hear here is my book, right? You see it. It's not very big. It's pretty skinny. Mm -hmm. um, but I have to say, I read a lot of nonfiction and I, I personally, this is a personal preference. I appreciate when books are shorter and I can maybe read a volume two or three versus looking at a four or 500 page nonfiction book that's really meaty. I have a couple of those, you know, and I'll get like 30 or 40 pages in and it feels overwhelming and daunting. So mm -hmm. I personally, when I look for a nonfiction book, I like them to be a little shorter in my book right here. Um, is 135 pages. And this is, I think, four by six. Um, so I was concerned too that when I published it, it was more, it was not long enough. And my editor kept saying, no, it's it's fine. It's a nonfiction. Yeah. You know, you've said it really concisely. You were not too wordy. So, you know, it's, it's a quick read because this was really a guide for parents to help their kids 
be recognized and excel in a school system that doesn't recognize people for certain gifts. Only, only they, they recognize very few kids for their gifts because they, they match certain criteria and they only teach kids a certain way. So I really wanted to give parents something quick and easy. So I think it depends too on your audience. My audience was parents, so I, I knew parents were busy and need, they needed quick and easy wins. So each chapter has a win. There's an accompanying um, worksheet that goes along with it to kind of document and have something you could, they can use to, to talk to their teachers in the classroom and administrators if they needed to. So in, in my sense, I, I like that. And plus, if I go someplace, this fits in my purse really nicely. Like it's, yeah. small, it's small, it's light, it's portable. You know, when I travel, I don't like to take tomes with me. Um, so that's just my personal take on nonfiction and length and, you know, the struggle that I had because I didn't think it was long enough. But I think, like Callie said, if you say it in as many words as you need, mm -hmm. clean it up, and that is it. Don't get too hung up on how many words it actually is, yeah. is for there. Well, and, um, and, and I think it's very important to point out, like, if you are intending on writing nonfiction for children, that um, that we word count is like a big deal to kid lit authors, mm -hmm. I feel. Um, and, and it is, I would say that they run on the shorter side. Yeah. Definitely. Um, I was looking, I have several nonfiction books sitting on my desk and um, the biggest one that I have out of them is a 289 pages, which is probably, um, probably around 50,000 words is what I would say is it's mm -hmm. probably coming to. So, um, you know, it's not going to be the um, 100,000 word novel. Yeah. Definitely. For, for sure. For for sure. I mean, and if if your your book is boy is that long, I mean, I would recommend putting it up into a series. You know, part one, right. part two, part three, part four, and then people can get the book set. And there's all sorts of cool things you can do from a marketing perspective with multiple volumes in a series versus one huge thing. Right. Well, and um, I reposted the address for the readability website. Perfect, um, it used to be readable readability.io, but it looks like they have changed their okay. address. So I actually went and posted it, brought it up. Okay. So I'm Perfect. not sure why they changed it, but they changed it. So it is weird. It's funny when that happens. I'm guessing their domain name expired and someone snatched it up, you know, minutes before the person went to go go renew it is, is yeah. what I would do. That happens a lot. Yeah. Okay. Um Gabrielle yeah. says T B. I'm not sure what T B is. T B here. Oh yeah. Is that just for us, us to know? Yeah. Okay. Oh yeah. She put it in yeah because it was not, not coming up with the right okay. thing. All right. All right. Let me make sure I'm going back through the questions, comments. Nancy's here. Hey, Nancy. Yeah. Hi, Nancy. All right. All right. Um, Nancy has a question. So if I did several books in the series, each could be 10 to 15,000 words. Absolutely. Absolutely. And when, um, and so Nancy, what you and I were messaging about earlier, I think is a great, it's a great idea. And I, and I, I would say that you could either do it as a long book like you had talked about, but I think because you're because of your audience, because you're looking at that middle grade market, I do think doing it as a series, 10 to 15,000 words would make it much more digestible and accessible to that age. Um, because then you have like the over that it's all the Civil War, but then they can pick and choose which subject they're interested in that. Um, and, and I kind of think you could... Um, you could even expand on it past what you're even thinking of. And I know you've done a lot of research in that area um, because of your fiction books. And so I think turning that research into nonfiction is a great way. Um, it's almost like you're repurposing your content in that. Fantastic. That way. 
Yeah, I, and I'm I'm visualizing box sets later on and companions. Yes, absolutely. You know, here's a fiction and here's a companion to that if you want to know more of the details. I think there's a lot of cool ways to slice and dice that. Yeah. As far as, as, far as releasing the books and being kind of on a continuous release cycle. So you build up some momentum, get people reading this, they're excited for the next one. You make them wait a little bit for the book. You do the next one, have the same kind of run. And I mean, you could probably, depending on how many are in the series, you could do that over the course of a year, two years. Sure. And it would be awesome to see that happen. And and then you can just focus on this one thing and and go out there and do your interviews and, and do the whole bit and talk about, okay, here's what's next. Because that's always the question, right? When you write a book, well, what's next? Right. What's coming next? <laughs> So I think it's a great idea, Nancy. I would totally run with it. Yeah, awesome. This is so exciting. It's been, it's been so much fun to see all of the different ideas we have. Yeah. And, and they run really the gamut, you know, and things I've never thought about. So I love that you're all challenging me to think about, oh, that's interesting. I've never thought about that. Cool. I want to read this book now because, because now you've, you've brought it up and it's like one of those things like, like you know, you just kind of, is in the back of my mind running thinking, oh, I wonder where that idea came from. But that's so cool. Yeah. So I want to congratulate all of you for being here and doing the work and showing up. And if you have more questions, definitely pop them below. I do want to address though, Kelly, we want to talk about um, posting things. I know sure. as everyone's posting a little more, it's getting a little harder to find the things we haven't commented on. So do you want to address that? Yeah, and so if you need to ask a question, I think using the hashtag ask is a great way to for it to um, yeah. get brought to our attention because we, we do get notifications when you post in there, but I know that I'm having the, the issue of like now I'm seeing because of the way that Facebook groups works, it's like bumping mm -hmm. up if somebody has commented on it, mm -hmm. and so some of the stuff that hasn't been commented on or seen is going lower down and it's a little bit harder to access. So um, I would I would recommend using that the hashtag ask. Um, do you think it would be helpful also for them to do like hashtag day one, hashtag day two? Like yeah, that? that would be great because that way it allows Callie and I to go do a search and everything that has a certain hashtag we can pull up just to make sure because we don't want you to be left hanging by us not getting to your questions or yeah. your posts each day. So if you could just help us find your stuff, that would be awesome. Thank you so much for doing that. Yeah, I would appreciate it too. And and some of you have privately messaged me too to ask questions, and that is perfectly fine too. If you're if you feel, I know sometimes when you ask a question, it's like, well, is that a dumb question? You know, um, which there is no dumb questions. Yeah. But if you're afraid to post it in the big group, you can always message it to me. And um, and like Nancy did, um, it she asked a great question that I hadn't even thought about. And so I did, and I felt like that needed to be dressed in the bigger um, audience. So that also helps us to kind of know maybe areas that we haven't fleshed out or explained as good as we did. Who's a ding dong? I can't yeah. see. Is it I can't see it yet either. It hasn't popped up. There's a, there's a little bit oh, of a delay Mary. when I watch my phone, so it hasn't popped up yet. Is it Mary? Yeah, it's Mary. Um, yeah, it's, you're not a ding dong. It's just <laughs> if somebody comments on a post, it bumps it up. Yes. And, and so sometimes posts get lost because they're not commented on. So they go further and further down the line and it makes it a little bit harder to see it. So you are not a ding dong. You, um, you are a victim of Facebook's algorithm is what has happened. Right. Right. And if you're, and this happens a lot to like, pretty much everywhere, right? You, you know you posted something awesome or you, you want to go back to it. So there's a search feature inside the group. And if you just search your name, it should yeah, pull up all of, all of the posts that you made. So you can you can search by yourself as well. That way you can go revisit them also. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Yay, so this is a fun day, fun day. I know. And I Young and I had discussed that this this was almost the hardest, it was the hardest day to write. And it was really mm -hmm. the hardest day to kind of figure out what we wanted to say with this because it really is an important component, but it's kind of um just like with pacing and flow. Um 
if you are not traditionally a writer, this concept is a little bit harder to grasp. Um, and it's also harder to identify, I think. So um, yeah. if, it's, if it's hard for you at this point, don't worry about that. It's kind of one of those things that comes like, just like with reading, the more you read, the better writer you come. And um, the more that you write, the more that you're going to notice some of these pitfalls that that writers yeah. fall into and you'll be more aware of them. Um, and again, um, you can always edit them out later. Absolutely. And if you guys have gone in to use Otter, you may notice that it's not 100% accurate. And that's <laughs> actually a good thing, right? Because you're going to have to go back and edit it anyway. So it's no yeah. big deal. Because now that they're in Otter, what you can do now is, is export them as a TXT file, which is just a text file. And then you can put them in some place like a Google document. So they're all together in one place. That's kind of how I compile my stuff. I shared yesterday my kind of my process for using repurposed content and how to use something like Otter to grab the actual transcription. And then that transcription, you know, turns into a book. And of course, you know, if you record at different times, there's going to be some overlap. But the beauty is you get to choose which way you like it that you sounded better. Like, you know, some days you'll say something like, ah, oh, I didn't quite hit it, you know, where I, how I wanted to describe it. And the next day you're like, yeah, that's what I missed yesterday. I didn't say it like that yesterday. I like this better. So being right. able to hear yourself too gives you a lot of insight into the ideas being sparked as well, because you know, you're hearing yourself, you get to understand how you process things, how you describe things. And then it really opens up the the floodgates, I feel on, oh, yeah, I, I can think about this and this and this and listening back definitely allows you to see kind of those next steps progress. I'm very visual. So I, when I when I hear things, I can start to see these motion pictures sort of, you know, materialize. And that's why I, we love Otter for that reason, because when you can hear it, it, all of a sudden, like, there's just so much more that you can have access to. Yeah, absolutely. And Otter's just a great tool. And the best part is that it's free. And it's, yeah, it's 600 incredible. minutes a month, which is, which is plenty for you to get yeah. 600 minutes of recording. That's a lot of words. I mean, that's enough words probably for at least two volumes of a book, if not more. <laughs> Depending on how fast you speak. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. Well, if there aren't any questions, I wanted to say again, congratulations to all of you. It's day three. We're halfway through this five-day challenge. It's been such a fun adventure, seeing everything kind of unfold and seeing these stories. Kelly, do you have any words of wisdom as everyone goes off on their Wednesday to capture and create? Well, um, I I have said this, I feel like I've said this about 20 times, but I'm just going to reiterate it because I do think it's so important. As you go through this homework and as you spend time writing, don't edit yourself as you do it, just make sure that you get it on paper in some form, whether you're speaking through Otter or you're actually sitting at a computer. You can edit yourself later, but it is very, very, um, I think that getting past yourself and getting it on paper and getting it, that is where that's the hardest step. And once you can get past that hardest step, all of the rest of it is easy. So don't censor yourself. Just get out <laughs> there and do it and, and then worry about the editing process later. Yes. Yeah, that's a whole nother step. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I, this is a struggle for me because especially when I'm typing, this is yeah. why I almost have to do it verbally because I don't edit. I can stop and like re-record it, but I don't go back and hem and haw like, and I can make it sound better. Like, so it's faster for me to actually speak it because I don't, like the ability to self edit is not really there in yeah. that tool. Yeah. yeah. All right, everyone, have an amazing Wednesday. We cannot wait to hear your voices inside the group. Oh, and before I forget, tomorrow, we're gonna go live a little bit later at 11 oh, yeah. a.m. Pacific time. So two hours later, We'll make sure that when you get the email in the morning, the time is in there as well. Yeah. So, if, yeah. Well, it's a good thing I remember that, Callie, before we hopped off. I know. I know. So that would be 2 o'clock Eastern time, 1 o'clock Central, 12 o'clock Mountain, 
11 o'clock Pacific for y'all. And so. Perfect. All right, everyone. We will see you tomorrow. Have a great day. Bye. Bye. Are you fired up and ready to take action on today's challenge activities? If so, be sure to save your seat at kickstartyourbook.com. It is never too late to join us inside of this challenge. It is free for now. That will change in the future. So come on over while it is free to you and help us to help you kickstart your book this year because sometimes all you need is a little help and a push in the right direction. We'll see you inside the challenge. Cheers.